And now for the decade of 1810, and possibly one of the most notable events of this decade in the United States was the War of 1812. Now, some wars seem to be wars that were fought over very important or crucial issues, and other wars seem like maybe they were rather pointless or ill-conceived. And the War of 1812 seems to me like possibly one of the most pointless and ill-conceived wars in the history of the United States. So what was this war all about? Uh, so recall that Napoleon was wanting to conquer Europe and he was attacking England and that resulted in a French-English war. So the, the English and the French were at war with each other and neither the French nor the English uh, wanted the United States trading with its enemy. And so the English were stopping the United States from trading with France and people in the United States were upset about this issue of free trade, that they were upset with the British for stopping us from trading with France. Now, France was also trying to stop us from trading with Britain. Uh, I think they, that Britain was probably more effective in stopping us and people were more upset about the fact that Britain was stopping us from trading with France. So one issue was free trade. Uh, another issue was this issue of impressment. That is, in the British Navy, uh, they were concerned that some of their sailors might have been deserting the Navy and joining merchant ships from the United States. And so uh, the British Navy, if they saw a United States merchant ship, they might stop that ship and board it and search the ship for potential British deserters. And if they found those deserters, I guess they would take them or arrest them or take them back into the, the British Navy for punishment. And the United States was upset that the British were stopping our merchant ships and boarding them forcefully and searching them without a permission for deserters. So that was another issue. Now, as it turns out, and one of the things that makes this war seem rather pointless is that actually in Britain, the parliament had voted to stop the practice of impressment and they voted to stop the practice of impressment before the United States declared war on England. The issue, though, was that in the United States, we didn't know this because it takes time for the message to travel over the ocean. So although the British Parliament voted to stop this practice, the United States had not yet got the message that they stopped the practice. And that was part of the issue for why the United States declared war on England. And then another issue uh, was that people in the United States were accusing uh, the English of inciting the natives was how they worded it. That is, they thought that the English were encouraging the Native American nations to fight the United States. And here's a picture of some propaganda from the time showing um, a picture of Native Americans who are scalping soldiers from the United States and giving those scalps to the English. So Britain was accused of inciting the natives. And so th those were some of the issues uh, that uh, started the war. Now, not everyone in the United States was in favor of declaring war on England. In fact, it was a rather controversial issue. And in general, it was the Republicans of the time who were in favor of the war and instigated it. And in general, the Federalists were opposed to the war. And this is part of what made the war seem rather ill-conceived because it was also the Republicans who were opposed to a standing military. So the Republicans voted down all the measures for military spending prior to the war, and they opposed measures to build up the Navy prior to the war. And then after they ensured that the United States didn't have a strong military, they then voted to go to war on England. Another thing that was a little bit odd about this whole situation is the fact that uh, the people who were most affected by the British actions were the merchants in the north who were trying to do business and trade uh, with Europe. And uh, but the the those merchants were mostly Federalists and most of the Republicans who were fa in favor of the war tended to be people that were living in the south. So the people in the south who were at least affected by British actions were the ones who voted to go to war on England. And not surprisingly, when the United States entered this war, we were highly unprepared. Uh, 
The plan was to have the surprise attack on Canada and overwhelm the British forces, because at this point, Canada would have been part of the British Empire. So the plan was to have the surprise attack and suddenly cross the border and, and overwhelm the British forces. And the idea was probably all the Canadians there would be happy to join us and be pleased that we liberated them from England. But the problem was is that the commanders of the United States forces were not very well trained and they, they, they were moving towards the Canadian border and they became anxious and, and they hesitated and they stopped, uh, which cost us the element of surprise and gave the British forces plenty of time to prepare. So they were defeated and not surprisingly, the first few years of the war went terribly for the United States. After a couple of years of fighting, the British troops, the British troops raided and uh, burned down Washington, D.C., which was at that point the new capital of the nation. And then actually at that point, the one little bright spot there is that the British then did try to proceed up the river to attack the city of Baltimore, uh, but they were unsuccessful. The United States held them back. And it was actually uh, when the British were trying to move up and attack Baltimore is when Francis Scott Key observed some of that battle and wrote the lyrics for the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, so, but in general, the things went poorly for the United States and we lost land. But there was one spectacular victory uh, uh, eventually where uh, the British were about to attack the city of New Orleans and, uh, and the United States defended it. And uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, who eventually became president, but he became a war hero because he led uh, the military force that defended the city of New Orleans successfully. And everyone was very pleased with that. But one little thing that was uh, made this whole thing even more pointless is that actually um, when Andrew Jackson defeated the British at New Orleans and that great big victory, that actually occurred after the war was already over because they didn't realize it, but over in Europe, a treaty had already been signed. And again, it takes time for the message to get from Europe to the United States. It has to cross an ocean. And in this case, it would have to cross the ocean, get to the East Coast and travel all the way to New Orleans so that the people in New Orleans would know that the war was over. So the war was actually already over. Um, they just didn't know it. But uh, our, our biggest victory was the one where Andrew Jackson def def defended New Orleans and defeated the British, albeit after the war was already over and the treaty was already signed. Now, what was in that treaty? What was, how did we end the war? Well, actually the treaty just returned us back to the status quo. Uh, in the treaty, no mentions was made of any of the key issues that the treaty didn't say anything about impressments or free trade or incitement of Native Americans. Now, part of the issue was that, that those were just no longer relevant issues because the war between France and the, between the French English war that had ended. Uh, and so there was no really, there was no longer an issue there. So some of this had just become things that were just no longer relevant. Um, and basically the treaty was, let's just return things to the status quo that the British agreed to give us back the land that they had taken during the war. So we got the land back that they had taken. And it basically just returned everything to the status quo um, Although it was spun as a victory in the United States, it was spun as uh, people saw it as, oh, Andrew Jackson defeated the British and we won the war. So it's typically in the United States, people saw it as a big victory and they saw it as Andrew Jackson's victory. But the truth was, it was simply uh, a return to status quo that actually happened before Andrew Jackson defeated the British at New Orleans. Another thing in politics that is notable about the decade of 1810 is this was a time when there was a rise in the idea of colonialism. So what is colonialism? So colonialism was this idea that the United States should establish a colony in Africa and that black people in the United States should be deported and sent to Africa. And in 1816, the American Colonization Society was founded to support the idea of colonialism. Interestingly, this idea of colonialism was supported both by people who were abolitionists and by people who were pro-slavery. Now, the abolitionists thought that we should end slavery and then send all the black people to Africa, where the pro-slavery people thought this should be a place where we send the free black people, but still keep slaves in the United States. So the pro-slavery people were more concerned about the idea that free black people uh, might incite riots and make the United States an unsafe place to live. And so the pro-slavery people 
wanted to send the free black people to Africa, whereas the abolitionists wanted to end slavery and send all the black people to Africa. As you might not be surprised to note that most black people in the United States never favored colonialism themselves. They did not want to be deported if this was now their home. Uh, and although over time, a few hundred black people actually were sent to Africa or moved to Africa, although mostly this idea was never actually enacted. It was often debated and talked about, uh, but not much action was ever taken on the idea of colonialism. Hey. And as I just mentioned, the ongoing war between France and England ended around this time. So Napoleon had been trying to, to conquer Europe and he was attacking England. But finally, in 1815, Napoleon was captured. But then he escaped and regrouped and started attacking again. But then he was defeated for a final time at Waterloo in 1815. So Napoleon is finally defeated. And after that, there is this Congress of Vienna that redraws the map of Europe. And that's the map you're looking at right now. And this map includes this area called Prussia, and then a whole bunch of German states, and then this Austria area over. So there's Prussia, Austria, and a large number of German states like Bavaria and Saxony and Hanover. And this redrawn map is relevant because a lot of the future psychological ideas that we'll be talking about that originated in Europe and then were imported to the United States, many of those things are things that came from especially some of these German states. So this is going to be relevant in our future story. For example, one of the psychological theories that came out of this part of Europe around the decade of 1812 an idea that eventually was imported to the United States was the idea of phrenology. And phrenology was proposed by Franz Joseph Gall, who was born in the German areas, and then he lived in Vienna and eventually moved to Paris. And phrenology was basically the idea that you can determine someone's personality by the shape of their skull. That is, if you carefully measure the size and shape and bumps on someone's skull, you can use that information to understand that person's personality. Now, it's notable that Gall's phrenology could be viewed from two different perspectives. Because on one hand, he clearly misunderstood how the human brain works, and he clearly failed to use scientific method. Yet, on the other hand, he did represent some advancement in, of, of understanding of the human brain. And in some ways, he actually did use scientific method. So in general, what did Gall do? He thought he located 27 different powers or functions of the human brain. These would be like parts of personality. So like tenderness would be a function of the brain and pride would be a function and greediness would be a function. And he made three basic assumptions in his theory. So the first assumption is that the cranium or the skull reflects the shape of the brain. The second is that these mental abilities things like intelligence or tenderness or pride or greediness, these mental abilities are innate and fixed for the entirety of someone's life. And his third assumption is that these mental abilities, uh, they're related, they're localized in different parts of the brain. And the, the, the strength of the ability is related to the size of the brain organ. So in other words, if your brain has a large tenderness area, then you'll be a tender person. If your brain has a large intelligence area, you'll be an intelligent person. If your brain has a small pride area, then you won't be very prideful. Or if you have a small greedy area, you won't be greedy. So he thought there were these 27 different powers or functions. They're localized in the brain. Each part of the brain controls a different part of a different function. And that the size of the brain determined the strength of that function. And that because the size of the brain determines the size of the function, the size of the brain can be determined by 
palpitating or feeling the cranium, the skull. And so if we measure people's skulls, we can determine what their personalities are. So that was his basic approach. Um, now, on one hand, he was scientific in that he engaged in very extensive measurement. Uh, he measured people carefully and went around the world uh, measuring people's skulls and trying to determine their personalities and make note of how the shape of their skull was related to their personality. So this is one way in which he actually did use scientific method. He did use extensive uh, empirical observation. He was uh, measuring people very carefully. Uh, on the other hand, he failed to use a scientific method in terms of he failed to use any kind of hypothesis testing. That is, once he decided, once he determined, ah, this spot right here on the brain determines this personality type, or this spot is a spot for greediness, once he determined that, he just assumed that that must be greediness. So if he measured someone else and they had a bump there, he'd say, oh, you must be a greedy person. And if they didn't have a bump there, he said, well, you must not be a greedy person. And if evidence showed that, well, maybe this person didn't really seem to be that greedy, he would say, well, the evidence must be wrong. That person probably is more greedy than we realize. And this led to a type of circular reasoning. Uh, there's actually a famous situation um, where uh, some of the results uh, showed that the famous philosopher Rene Descartes uh, was found to have a very small forehead, uh, which according to Gall's theory would suggest that uh, he wasn't very intelligent. And Gall concluded, well, I guess maybe Descartes wasn't that smart after all. So he used this kind of circular reasoning uh, that once he decided uh, a certain area of the skull reflected a bump in a particular area, reflected a particular personality trait, uh, then uh, when he found a bump there, he assumed that person must have that personality trait, regardless of what the evidence was. So he partly used scientific method, he partly did not. Um, so I have down here, he used an empirical method, there was extensive measurement, but his problem was he focused on confirmatory evidence and didn't actually engage in a process of hypothesis testing, which would have been necessary if he was to fully use the scientific method. Now, one important contribution is that he did believe in localization. He did have the idea that the brain is partly responsible for controlling these different powers for different things like tenderness and pride and greediness. And although we know the brain is not localized that way, we don't have a pride spot, we don't have a greediness spot, the basic idea of localization in the brain, the different parts of the brain can be responsible for different functions, uh, that actually turned out to be to some degree true. So uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding, but in some ways there was one component, at least the idea of localization, is something that later turned out to be somewhat true about how the brain works. One interesting thing to note about Gall, given his dedication to careful assessment and measurement, is that he actually collected skulls from deceased people as part of his research and he actually acquired a very large collection of skulls. And maybe partly for that reason, some people viewed him as rather a quack, a rather odd, unusual person. And here is a cartoon from London in 1826 that's supposed to be depicting Gaul giving a lecture to a crowd of people with all of his phrenology heads and skulls around him, depicting him as a rather kind of oddball person. So not everyone was enamored with Gaul's ideas. So anyway, it was during the decade of 1810 when Gall published a four-volume book set describing his theory of phrenology. And when he published, he had a publication partner, that is a co-author, who was Johann Spursheim. So Gall and Spursheim published phrenology stuff together. And although they both were co-authors, it is interesting to note there was some striking differences between these two men. So for example, Gall when he talked about his mental functions that he was discovering them, he described them as fixed abilities. He thought he was looking at traits that were innate and that would last a person's lifetime. In contrast, Spursheim was more interested in using phrenology for self-help. Uh, he thought that maybe if we use phrenology and discover someone's strengths, that person could capitalize on their strengths. Or if we discover an area of weakness in someone's personality, maybe that person could then do things to build up that weakness. So Spursheim wanted to use phrenology for self-help. Also, Gall was more the scientist. 
Now we saw that he failed to use hypothesis testing, but he was extensively devoted to the empirical method, to, being, to doing careful assessment and measurement. So Gall was devoted to measurement and assessment, trying to use scientific method, to some degree the best they knew how at this point in history. Whereas Spursheim was more a sensational promoter. He wanted to sensationalize phrenology and make it popular. Interestingly, after Gall's death, uh, Spursheim lived several years and he often used dramatic demonstrations. So for example, sometimes he'd do demonstrations where he'd get people and he'd pass a magnet over particular areas of the brain that were supposed to correspond to personality traits and that was supposed to make a person display that, that trait. So Spursheim was more the, the sensational promoter. And he lived a lot longer than Gall did, so in some ways Spursheim might be responsible for making phrenology a, a rather popular thing. And as we'll see eventually, uh, this will eventually make its way to the United States and actually become quite popular.